celebrate the completion of elementary school, my sixth grade class took a, a three-day trip to Catalina Island. Uh, it's located about 20 miles off the coast of Southern California. Beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, we stayed at this great little camp uh, with a, right down on the shoreline of the island, rocky shoreline, and several of my friends uh, noticed that off the, the dock, uh, in the water there, you could see schools of fish swimming around. And uh, so uh, they spent their free time trying to catch those fish. Uh, the camp had a store where they sold, uh, sold a little bit of fishing line with a hook, and, and it wasn't even really a fishing pole, just kind of like a little handle thing. And so you can imagine, here's these sixth grade boys dangling their arm off, you know, off the dock, trying to catch these fish. But the thing is, they didn't have any bait. <laughs> um, so, I mean, they spent hours dangling just bare hooks in the water, hoping that somehow some fish would just swim up and decide to bite onto that hook. <laughs> Needless to say, they didn't catch anything. Uh, I mean, no fisherman casts a hook into the water without bait, right? It doesn't work. Fish aren't attracted to it. The hook has to be hidden. It has to be tucked away in something enticing, something appetizing. Um, now, I'm sure fish probably see what happens to other fish when they bite into those appetizing things, right? And they get jerked out of the water, uh, but they're not able to resist. Right? They don't have that mental capacity to recognize the danger involved. But I think, uh, you know, sexual temptation has that kind of pull on us. I mean, unlike fish, we do have the mental capacity to recognize the danger. We're aware of the, the kinds of consequences people encounter when they engage in sexually immoral behavior. Things like sexually transmitted diseases and unplanned pregnancies. We hear about you know, the damaging and addictive nature of pornography. Um, we see in, in people the emotional scars they carry from uh, illicit sexual activity. And yet, we're, we're kind of like those fish. I mean, that's not enough. We're still tempted. And in our society, we increasingly cast off any restraints. And so, this morning, I want to ask the question, is, is resisting sexual temptation, is it really worthwhile? And if so, how? How can it be done? I mean, particularly in the world in which we live. Today, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 14. And there, Paul presented five thoughts that help us resist sexual temptation. Now, you may be surprised to hear that the people of Paul's day faced a lot of the same temptations that we face. Now, they obviously, they didn't have digital media uh, pumped into their homes. But uh, what was different and maybe even worse about ancient, the ancient world was that prostitution was rampant. In fact, it was actually promoted in their societies. It was incorporated into a uh, false religion, into the pagan religious rituals. So uh, it, was, it was commonplace in their society to see prostitutes um, wandering around and, and, and that openly uh, pushed in their society. Um, so people were just as, as open, maybe even more so, than what we encounter today. So Paul here taught that those who, those who receive God's saving grace through faith in Christ need to move forward. That's what we've been talking about through Ephesians 4 and 5. They need to leave the old life behind, particularly in regard to any sexual immorality. And so he gave this practical advice about how to direct our thoughts. And the first thought that he, he gives us has to do with identity. You know, my wedding day began with a, a drizzly uh, morning in May. Uh, the ceremony was scheduled for 7 o'clock at night, but we did all of our pictures before the wedding, so we began around noon. And um, we tried to dodge all the puddles, but we still wound up 
with a muddy spot on the train of my wife's dress. Once we discovered that, I mean, her mom went straight to work getting that clean, right? Because it, it has to be perfect for the wedding ceremony. I mean, brides only wear their dress once, right? So it has to be perfect. Well, in, in the same way, we as, as Christians, as believers, whether male or female, we were late to, to Jesus Christ as his bride. We're waiting for the wedding ceremony. In fact, Paul used that image in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Take a look here. He said, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and catch this, gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. And then he says, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. See, so you get the idea. When we trust in Christ, we're changed. We are made holy through Christ. We receive a, a new Identity, And that's how Paul talks about it here in Ephesians 5.3. He says that in God's eyes, we're saints, holy ones. Look at what he says, verse 3 there, Ephesians 5.3, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. So if we're saints, shouldn't we avoid any behavior that would contradict that identity, anything that would leave a stain on us. If we want to overcome sexual temptation, we need to think that way. We need to think of our identity as saints. Now there in that verse, Paul used three words uh, to define the kind of behavior that contradicts that identity as saints. Take a look back there. The first one he mentioned was sexual immorality. Uh, now, sexual immorality is any behavior that departs from God's design for sexual activity. That, that design was made clear all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, at the beginning of creation. Genesis 2, verses 24 through 25. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And then it says, And the man and his wife were both naked, and we're not ashamed. Sex is designed to express and to deepen the permanent union of one man and one woman as husband and wife. It's a holy and good blessing from God. Proverbs 5 talks about that, verses 15 through 19, if you want to read more about it. And so any any sexual activity that departs from that design, from God's good and perfect design, is by definition immoral. Right? So adultery, premarital sex, homosexuality, they all have to be considered immoral because they don't follow God's design. Now the second word that Paul used there in Ephesians 5.3 points to, I think, the consequence of sexual immorality. Take a look there. He says, but sexual immorality and all impurity. You see, such activity, it, it, it's, he's categorizing that activity. It's impure. It's unclean. That terminology recalls the Old Testament law. If you've ever tried to read through the law and you get bogged down in the book of Leviticus, where there's all these rules about what's considered clean and unclean. Right? Paul pulls upon that same idea here, because the whole idea in the Old Testament law was that certain actions, certain things would defile a person and make them unclean so that they couldn't enter into the presence of God. Right? They weren't acceptable to him. And so I think that's what Paul's getting at here. Sexual, sexually immoral behavior leaves a stain on us. It makes us unclean so that we can't enter into God's presence. Now, uh, Paul makes that same point in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at the way he talks about it here. 
He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then look at the list he gives here. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, same term that we just read, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, so he's talking about specifically there when somebody who's married has uh, sex outside of marriage. Nor, he says, men who practice homosexuality. And then he continues, speaks of some other areas of sin, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, thankfully, he doesn't stop there. Right? That stain does not have to be permanent. Through Christ, it can be washed away. That's what he says in the next verse, verse 11. And such were some of you, the people he was writing to in Corinth. In other words, they had engaged in those kinds of behaviors. Corinth was particularly known for its prostitution. Right? <laughs> I'm sure a lot of, most of the people in the church probably had sexual immorality in their past. And so he says, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So when we trust in Christ, we're cleansed from our impurity. So the point, going back to Ephesians 5, is if you've been cleansed, if you've been washed of that impurity, why would you go back to it? Why would you allow yourself to consider it? There's one more word there in Ephesians 5, 3. He says, sexual immorality, all impurity, or covetousness. I think, that, I think with that term, I think Paul's reminding us of the source of sexual temptation. Now, we don't often use the word covet to refer to sexual temptation. But if you remember the Tenth Commandment, the Tenth of the, of, of the Ten Commandments, it talks about, it tells us to not covet, right? And one of the examples that it gives, it, it talks about the example of coveting your neighbor's wife. Right? So coveting can have a sexual connotation. That was the idea there. Now what makes that Tenth Commandment stand out among the, the Ten is that all the other ones are physical actions that someone does. But the Tenth Commandment is something in the heart. Right? Coveting is just a desire. It doesn't even have to, to be expressed in an action. It takes place inside. Someone may never see it in us. And so I think that comes into play here in this passage as we're talking about sexual immorality. See, we'd like to think that sexual temptation is all a matter of external circumstances. Right? It's so much easier to blame it on the media or the culture or, you know, someone's immodest dress or behavior. But the true source of sexual temptation is in our own hearts. Now, circumstances do influence us, and the uh, book of Proverbs in particular highlights the wisdom of avoiding those circumstances whenever we can. But we have to remember that sin comes from within. You could have all the right circumstances in the world and there's still going to be sin. Jesus made that point with the Pharisees in his day. In Mark chapter 7, of course, you remember the Pharisees were focused very much on the externals. Right? And so Jesus said in Mark 7, 21 through 22, he said, For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. See, the battle against sexual temptation is not a battle against your circumstances primarily. It's a battle of the mind. It's a battle against our own desires. And in, in, getting back to Ephesians 5, 3 here. When we give in to that temptation, we are allowing ourselves to be defined by our sinful desires rather than by what God's made us to be as saints. See, if you're a Christian, through the work of the Holy Spirit in you, you can choose to resist those desires because of Christ's work 
in your life. You have to remember your identity as a saint, as a holy one, cleansed in Christ. The next thought that comes out of this passage in Ephesians 5 is gratitude. When my kids were young, we would read them the story of the little engine that could. Remember that story? Right? Struggling with all of its might to climb the mountain. I think I can. I think I can. But think for a moment. If we change the story, let's say we change the story, and the little engine just thinks that the, the tracks up the mountain were just too hard. They're unrealistic. Right? What if the little engine just wanted to follow his own heart and choose his own course? Right? I mean, a lot of people would applaud that today. The courage to be true to yourself. But the fact of the matter is, it's a train, right? Once he got off the rails, he'd be stuck. And though the rails may seem constraining, the rails are what give the little engine strength and freedom to move forward and conquer the mountain. Well, it's the same way with us and with God's laws, His commandments. Resisting sexual temptation is an uphill battle. And so a lot of people decide to ignore the track that God's laid down. They think that they can find a better way by just following their heart, right? But those rails of God's commandments, those are what give us strength and freedom to move forward. And Jesus used a different picture to make the same point. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 through 30 tells us that he said this. He talked about uh, an ox with a yoke. He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, rather than throwing off the yoke, rather than trying to, to go off the rails, we should be grateful for the direction that we receive from our Creator, particularly in regard to sexuality. Now, what we see here in Ephesians 5.4 is that Paul sets gratitude in opposition to some ways that people try to undermine God's commands. Take a look. Look at what he says there, Ephesians 5.4. He says, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Now, first Paul mentioned filthiness. The New International Version translates that word as obscenity. But I think that may be too strong a translation. Uh, the adjective form of that word is used four other times in the New Testament, and it always talks about feelings of shame or feelings of disgrace. Um, so in verse 3, Paul talked about being impure in, God, in God's eyes. Here, I think he has in mind the experience of someone, uh, that sense of shame and pollution that a person feels when he or she gives in to sexual temptation. Right? And, and when that happens, some people wallow in the shame of their sin. They feel like it's something that can't be dealt with, that can't be taken away. But you know, that, that's not necessary. The Scripture, the, the good news of the Gospel is that in Christ we can be forgiven and cleansed. Remember these words from 1 John 1.9? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, confession is the acknowledgement that we've come off the rails. <laughs> so I've lost my way. I've gotten off. I need to get back. Why should you wallow in shame in that sense of filthiness when you can be forgiven? Right? I think that sense of shame, that sense of filthiness can, can be something that if we let it, that it undermines the truth of God's forgiveness. We should be, that's where the gratitude comes in at the end of the verse. We can be grateful for forgiveness, not wrapped up in and buried under the shame. 
Next, in, in that verse, Paul spoke of foolish talk. Now, I know we tend to think of uh, foolishness as like lighthearted humor, right? But that's not the way the biblical, uh, I, that's not the biblical idea of foolishness. In, in the Bible, foolishness is something that's deadly serious. So Psalm 14, 1 says this, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There's none who does good. So you see, when we come to the New Testament and Paul mentions foolish talk, I think what he was getting at is the way that people try to justify uh, their sin by rejecting the existence of God. Um, now, here's what happens. You see, I think people feel shame for immoral behavior, but rather than wallowing in it, what some people do is they argue against it. They try to kill that sense of conviction. They try to, to harden uh, their heart and to, to push it aside. And so, for instance, they, they may claim something like uh, that sexual morals are just antiquated cultural standards foisted upon us by previous generations. Right? Fool, this foolish talk often sounds very academic, very logical. Uh, they may rely upon surveys and social research to say that, you know, no one really follows those old biblical standards anyway. Right? See, what this comes down to is they don't want to acknowledge the existence of God or the wisdom of His commandments because that would force them to confront their sin. So much easier to argue against God. So, um, we don't have to answer the fool according to his folly, it says in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4. We only need to express our gratitude to God. And here's the amazing thing. When we focus on giving thanks to God and we see life in that light, those, that foolish talk, those arguments just begin to fall apart. You can't sustain that worldview when you're being thankful to God. They contradict each other. Be thankful to God for His, the truth that He's given us. Now there's one more term there in Ephesians 5, 4. Paul says, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor, he adds, crude joking. Now, I think most Christians would probably acknowledge that it's inappropriate to tell a dirty joke, but what about hearing them? Is that wrong? Well, you know, some Christians claim to be shocked and offended. Others seem to be entertained and just go along with it. How do we process all of that? Well, I think, first of all, we need to understand that words in and of themselves the words we hear don't defile us, right? That's something outside of us, but they can influence us, right? Humor is not neutral, is it? Um, this week I came across a comment from a journalist named Ezra Klein, and he said this, uh, talking about a different issue altogether, but he said, jokes about socially unacceptable things aren't just jokes, they serve a function of normalizing that acceptable thing. That's what happens with jokes about things that are sexually immoral. They, they do just that. They, they are an attempt to minimize feelings of shame and guilt. Right? So we shouldn't be entertained by that. <laughs> but neither should we be offended uh, Here's my thinking. If God has rescued us from our shame by His grace, then we should always show thankfulness to God and compassion for people. Right? We don't want to be complicit with their um, minimizing of God's Word, nor do we want to be condescending. See, see that for what it is. See the heart that's involved that's trying to find a way to escape from the truth of Scripture and from the demands of God's law. It's, it's sad when you think about it that way. We should feel compassion. 
And so for us, if we're going to resist the influence of all of those things, the key there, that Paul draws out, which is brilliant in Ephesians 5.4, be thankful. Practice gratitude for God's guidance, for His Word, for His commands, for His standards. Acknowledge His wisdom all the time. Give, give thanks. The next thought that comes out in this passage, thirdly, is the thought of judgment. You know, my wife and I served as foster parents from 2010 to 2013. And when we applied, the state's licensing process included a, a thorough safety inspection of our home. Along with several other concerns, the inspectors made sure that every dangerous chemical, cleaning supplies, you know, anything like that, any medication, was all locked away and put high out of reach. After two years, they came back and they did the same inspection again. And if we would have continued doing foster care, they would have continued to do it over and over again. Why? Because human nature is to forget, right? It's to grow careless and sloppy, even about something that could be harmful or deadly. And I think that happens with the issue of sexual immorality. And so here in Ephesians 5, Paul wants to remind us that, it's, that there's a danger involved. He points out the danger of sexual sin in verses 5 and 6 by showing us its eternal consequences. Look at what he says there. He says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God, a uh, kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. See, in order to resist sexual temptation, we need to think about the reality of God's judgment against sexual sin. Right? And Paul considers it here from two perspectives. He talks about what people have not received and what they will receive. First, some people haven't received or won't receive an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That idea of, of the kingdom runs throughout the Bible from beginning to end. Remember, God created Adam and Eve uh, to rule over the earth, it says in Genesis 1. But you know the story. They rebelled against God in their sin. And then God begins to, to uh, rebuild His kingdom after that. He chooses Abraham and, and promises him uh, a land and, and a notoriety for his descendants. God even gives them uh, a king right? And laws to guide them. But it wasn't enough. They, they still sinned. They needed something more. They needed someone to rescue them from their sins and to transform them internally. And so God sent His Son. He sent Jesus Christ to accomplish that mission. And we know that Jesus is also the perfect King who will one day return uh, to fulfill all of those kingdom promises. Now, when we believe in Christ... He gives us an inheritance. He gives us a place in that future kingdom. And along with that, He begins to transform our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I think Paul wanted to make sure that his readers understood that those whose lives are characterized by sexually immoral behavior don't have a place in that kingdom. That's the way he says it. They don't have an inheritance. And so look at what he does there in verse 5. He repeats the same list that he used back up in verse 3. Sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness. But then he adds this little qualification. He says that is idolatry. Right? His point is that this behavior is essentially the same as worshiping a false god. Now we don't bow down to a statue... But what we're doing when we give in to sexual temptation is that we're uh, exalting our desires above God's. In other words, sexual immorality is 
really a form of worshiping yourself. So the point he's making here is how can someone worship himself while at the same time claim to be following Christ as Lord and King? You see, those are contradictory. If you claim to follow Christ, but you habitually ignore God's standards of immorality, then that claim is called into question. So Paul makes that point about not having a place in the kingdom, and then he argues that those who are characterized by sexual sin will receive God's wrath. And when we study the Gospels, Jesus spoke of future judgment in a way that he talked about some people being welcomed into his kingdom and others being cast out. In some places he talks about hell. Paul, however, when we look through Paul's writings, he focuses on this idea of God's wrath or anger. Right? It's the idea that sinful behavior provokes God. Uh, and so sexually immoral behavior is one of those sins, among many others. I mean, every sin provokes God's wrath. But Paul particularly wants to bring that out here. And he seemed to have expected that people would deny that connection. Look at the beginning of verse 6 there. He says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. How does... How does that, thinking about God's wrath and about His judgment, how does that help us resist sexual temptation? Well, I, I think this, these thoughts, they serve as like sirens, like flashing lights, right, to alert us. If sexual immorality keeps people out of God's kingdom and it provokes His wrath, it's like He's saying, don't excuse it. Right? Don't forget about it. Don't weaken your standard. Don't treat it lightly. Don't grow careless. Make every effort to resist it. There's another thought uh, there. It's the thought, if we want to resist sexual temptation, we need to focus on the idea of enlightenment. You know, the Gospels tell us multiple occasions when Jesus miraculously healed people who were born blind. Um, what an incredible experience that must have been for them. Having not been able to see suddenly to see the world and colors and right, nature, the sunset, all of those things for the first time as an adult. Um, but, you know, there's another side to that. I mean, we don't always like what we see in the world. Right? The world can be an ugly place. So what would you say if one of those blind men that Jesus healed, if he chose to stop looking, if he preferred to go back to being blind, if he started covering his eyes, I mean, would anyone ever really do that? Would anyone choose blindness over sight? I mean, not in physical terms. But what about in a spiritual sense? Is there a sense where we do that? Where we come to the place that we see spiritually, but we decide to close our eyes and live as if we don't see. Paul addressed this concern there in Ephesians 5, verses 7 through 10. Take a look. He says, Therefore do not become partakers with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. See, all of us enter this world not just in darkness, but as darkness. It's not just an inability to see, it's a state of being. Right? When we come to believe in Christ, though, a miraculous change takes place. Paul says it there. We become light. It's a change of our very nature. Jesus talked about that in John chapter 8, verse 12. He said, it says, And Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. 
Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, he enlightens us. So that, as Paul says here in Ephesians 5, so that we can discern what's good and right and true and pleasing. So that we can walk in the light. Right? That, uh, that enlightenment, that ability to see, then shapes our life, shapes our actions. We can bear fruit. But notice how Paul begins that section we just read in verse 7. He says, therefore, do not become partakers or partners with them. Whom did he have in mind? What was he talking about? Well, back up in the previous verse, he talked about the sons of disobedience. Right? Now, that was his way of referring to everybody who stands under the wrath of God. As Christians, we're supposed to be set apart. We shouldn't be partnering up in sinful behavior with unbelievers, particularly in, in regard to anything that is sexually immoral. Now, Paul expressed the same concern in Romans chapter 13. Look at the way he, he talks about it there. He says, The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. And then he says this, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. You know, even today, as much as people try to justify sexual immorality, it still generally takes place at night, doesn't it? Under the cover of darkness. There's a reason for that. People can't get away from that sense that it's wrong. And then there's some sense that maybe if, if it's in the dark, that it won't be seen. But God still sees. And so we're called to stand apart. We're called to walk in the light. Could that be said of you? Are you walking in the light? Does the truth of God that He's enabled you to see, does that guide how you live? Think about that enlightenment, that incredible blessing that He's opened your eyes, that He's poured light, His light into you if you've trusted in Him. So that you can see, you can know right from wrong, you can discern good, what's good and true. Follow that. And one more thought here. Another way to resist sexual temptation is to think about our mission. You know, thanks to uh, government regulations, in those incandescent light bulbs are becoming a thing of the past, right? Uh, I mean, and they did have a relatively short lifespan. You use them for a time and throw them out once they burn out because uh, they no longer serve their purpose. Right? And Jesus used a similar kind of analogy to talk about his followers staying on track with his mission. Matthew chapter 5, he said this, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. And then he said, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. See, one of the reasons to resist temptation is because God has given you a mission. He wants you to shine for Him. And look at the way Paul expresses that here, beginning in verse 11 of Ephesians 5. He says, Take no part... And the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. 
I, now, I don't think he's saying to expose sin necessarily by um, going around and, and confronting people. I don't think that's his point here. I think in the context of what we're talking about, he's talking about this exposure happens as you walk in the light. It's a natural outcome. It's the same thing Jesus was talking about in Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works, right? It's through the way that you live, that you choose to live a sexually pure life, that you resist sexual temptation. As you do that, it impacts people around you. Even though you may, you may never say a word about it, but people still pick up on it. And it's uncomfortable for them when they see that. It's unnerving. Because it is. It shines the light. But you know, the goal, I think, is there in verse 14. When he says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Right? That... God wants us to resist sexual temptation so that our testimony, that our life, that as that light shines through us, that other people can be aw awoken from the dead. Right? That they will awake. That they will come to turn to Christ. That they'll come to believe. They'll come into the light and be transformed by Him. And so we have to think about that. In those moments when temptation strikes, right? think about all of these things, all these things we've talked about today. Think about your identity as a saint. Think about the goodness of God's word and his guidance and be grateful and, and his forgiveness and salvation. Think about the reality of, of judgment. Right, that we don't want to go down that path. We don't want to play with something that, God, that provokes God's wrath. Think about the enlightenment, the idea that you've come to see the light. How could you turn your back on that? And think about the impact that if you give in to temptation... And somehow it dims that light shining through you. Right? It has an effect on the people around you. If, if you give in, then it's like that, that witness, that light is not shining the way that it should be. For your family, for your fellow believers in Christ, for, for people out in the world around us, the watching world. And so we have to resist. We have to fill our minds with these thoughts and use them to make the right choice again and again. To not give in when temptation strikes. So how do we respond today to, to this great chapter? Well, I'd encourage you, if nothing else, to at, at least read back through it. Read through Ephesians 5. We've covered these verses fairly quickly this morning, but... Um, there's so much more here. It's such a powerful chapter. Soak it in. Maybe today for you, um, this whole discussion of sexual immorality, maybe you're convicted over some area in your life, some way that you have given into temptation. Cling to that promise that we read from 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful. He's just to forgive us and to cleanse us. Would you receive the forgiveness of Christ today? You don't have to wallow in shame. You don't have to fight against that conviction. Come to Christ. Be forgiven. And then, are you focusing on living in the light? Do you look at life that way? Do you think about shining for Him? Everything that we do, the way we live, it matters. It's part of that mission that Christ has for us.
Maybe this morning memorizing some of these verses would be a good response for you. To take some of these and to, to repeat them to yourself over and over again so that they become ingrained into, the, into your mind and heart. May God help us to walk in the light.